Hello everybody, this is James Chai, RFRF Park Park Rescue Foundation, and today is November 22nd, 2019. This is my vlog episode number 40, the big 4-0, so I'm pretty excited, pretty happy uh, to have hit 40 uh, and, uh, well, you know, and to keep going on all this stuff. So I am today, uh, I posted up in the description down below, I posted up in the description uh, some of the things that I am going to talk about. And uh, I'm just trying to see if I'm going to refresh my, um, my whatchamacallit, um, my screen, which is not going. And I apologize for starting late. Um, I was just trying to get some personal errands done today and, and some other errands uh, as well as work and um, kind of fell behind on everything. So sorry to everybody. I know it's uh, Friday, so it's pretty late. So um, 9.30, everyone's probably out. Well, maybe partying. I don't know. Who knows? Okay. Alrighty. Um, okay, so wh what I'm going to talk about is uh, is teaching dogs simple words before they become complex. So we want to teach dogs the simplicity of simple conversational words, and then we can start to teach our dog to start uh, thinking and reasoning, and so that the words that we do use from the simplicity of, of the basic words will become uh, expand it so that our dogs can understand a, a complexity, a, a depth to those basic words. I put the notes on, so I'm just going to go over the notes and then I'll go over everything again. Um, uh, right, all right, I'm just going to go straight to it here. So it comes to, uh, the first one is teaching dogs simple words before they become complex, which is a title page, right? And it's to say, how do we get dogs to understand what we're talking about are we always using these traditional uh, terms that are used in the classic dog training industry uh, and, and these commands and they're so abrupt and in the, in the situations that since we live with our dogs, since we consider, I consider, and a lot of people consider our dogs are almost our children, our little furry loves and we take care of them and we talk to them and they talk to us in their own way by growling and vocalizing and making some really cool noises and sounds with us. And then they're always communicating by touching and coming up for pets and laying beside us. Uh, these are things that uh, allow us to have a cohabitation between the species, between a dog and human, and we're able to enjoy our each other's company. It's about cohabitation. It's about having conversations with our dog, making our dogs feel as if they are in the same value, the same level of value as we ourselves are, as the rest of our family is, the rest of our friends are when our dog is around. Our dog can tell who we're talking to, our dog can tell how we're talking to people. They can tell if we're upset, or we're happy, or we're energetic, or we're just normal mellow. What ends up happening is our dog hears those tones. And I've talked about this before. And so since, and, and I'm on my cell phone today because I just noticed that the, uh, the, the, the webcam on my, uh, my old, old computer is horrific. It's out of, uh, out of focus. Uh, I got to sacrifice either full picture or sound quality, and at least I can get a better picture here. Uh, hopefully, it's not going to uh, zap out, which is what Facebook tends to do. Um, so I wanted to get better clarity on this. So, um, hi, Mary. Uh, so it comes to uh, teaching dogs are, are simple words before they become complex, and again, that's teaching out words, uh, teaching words to our dogs in a basic format, just really simple terms in regular tone of voice, in our normal talking, our normal everyday voice, how we talk to people, you know how we're sometimes energetic or we're, we're not energetic and we're always kind of a uh, little bit, um, you know, it sounds like we're fake if we're talking to people we don't know, that they're telling us a story, uh, if we work in a service industry where we often we end up talking to people in a certain way or they talk to us in a certain way where we know there's not any genuine connection. And we can tell, we can just say, you know, we always say to somebody we're with, we're like, yeah, you know, I, that person really wanted that sale. They were really, right? we can tell. We really have to understand that with our dogs, they can tell from us. That's what they're trained for throughout their whole life through evolution. Our dogs listen for everything. They watch, they, 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 they are gauging. They, they don't, they don't, necessarily mimic they pattern they follow on purpose because they want to be with us they want to do what they think is fun what we do is fun they're watching and listening to everything whenever i work with my dogs i'm always using uh, regular words 
always, 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 always talking in a regular tone of voice with him, as you can tell when, you know, other past episodes where uh, Lincoln would be barking or all everybody would be barking, and I would just tell them, stop yelling, stop yelling. And I would say that in the way I would say it to somebody else, uh, you know, obviously a little bit more stricter because the, for my dogs or your dogs, they're going to get a little bit kind of, right? And then, and if we don't, if we are not firm with them, they'll, con uh, my, like, especially my guys, if I'm not firm with them, they'll continue to bark and bark until the cows come home. And I think a lot of people who have um, uh, tried the uh, the episode um, uh, dogs barking at noises outside, a lot of people have messaged me or told me uh, verbally that they've watched it and they've applied it and it has been working for them. They've had success and they're just talking normally to their dogs. And then um, even my friend Debbie, she says she's at home and her uh, her German Shepherd Ada starts barking out at the window. And after all the practice that she would have going up to Ada and telling her to get away from the window, uh, basically not actually even telling her to get away from the window, just telling her to stop yelling, stop barking, right? Like that. So stop yelling, stop yelling, and walking her back physically, and eventually it got to the point where Debbie can tell uh, Ada to, to calm down, basically, to stop yelling, to stop barking. Uh, those are conversational words. Those are always words that we're going to apply as if we were talking to a toddler. We want to instruct our toddler, we want to talk to them, we want to teach them uh, the right way to do things so that they don't get hurt, they don't fall down, they don't get burned by the stove. We are talking conversationally. We don't talk to our, our child who's about to touch a hot stove and go, don't do that. We are going to say, don't do that. Right? You're going to get hurt. We're not going to say, you're going to get hurt. But we talk to our dogs. A lot of people talk to their dogs that way. Oh, you're going to get hurt. You, you know, I mean, you know, like you, we want to keep, if, if, every, if our dogs are in our family, we want our dogs to understand that we're talking to them as part of our family, not as an extraneous or third-party addition to our home, but as part of our uh, breath, our, our blood, our life, our essence, our family, our, our connection. That's why I say pack mentality stuff is not correct. I always prefer actually it to as a group uh, mentality. Same thing as when you see a bunch of people together, right? They have people who will riot when in, a, you know, in, in, like if you see a baseball game and someone riot, and there's a riot going on, a lot of people will end up getting caught up by it, by the group mentality. That's what our dogs are. When we, when I use, uh, if I were to use terms like pack animals, pack, then it just devolves, it, it disrespects, it lowers my respect for my dogs. If I consider my dogs as just dumb animals, or just animals, then I'm going to be talking down to them. I'm not going to be using regular conversational tones. I would be getting more high-pitched, more emotional, getting them to stop barking out the window. I won't be having any reciprocal respect from them, and nor would I be thanking uh, my dogs for complying to my request. Same thing as I've said before, your, uh, you know, the waiter brings you, you know, you ask for a glass of water The waiter at a restaurant, the waiter brings you a glass of water. What do you say? You say, well, you should say, thank you. So this is the same thing we want to do with our dogs is having conversational uh, tones with them. We want to use conversational words, regular words that we would use with a toddler, say a three-year-old toddler, because again, we're talking about dogs being between the two to three year age um, human child. And they're going to have cognitive and emotional uh, skill sets that are at a rudimentary level. Yeah, they, they do. Um, I, I do, uh, Sammy, write, Sammy writes here in the live broadcast, uh, they understand so much when you talk to them all the time. They do. But we want to make, I, I want to make sure that it is in context, that it is in regular tone, as if you're talking to a friend or somebody, your loved one, someone at home. Um, you want to do that. You don't want to make it extraneous where we're repetitive. If we're being repetitive, then our dog's not listening to us because our dog's thinking, okay, just nagging, 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 right? It's the same thing as I say to people. If you're, um, if uh, you know, when you're a kid and you're growing up and your mom's telling you to clean your room, it's going to take your mom telling you to clean up your room about four years before you finally clean up your room. And then your mom just goes, the only reason you clean up your room after four years of your mom nagging you is because your mom just went <laughs> nuking her on you. And you're like, okay, I better do it now. Now she's finally angry. Um, but that's the only motivation. When it comes to our dogs, we want to be able to uh, talk to them in a normal way. 
in, in just a regular uh, tone of voice, but we want to be firm with them. And Mary uh, Crawford, she writes, stern, um, I, I would say uh, firm, and firm is a much more uh, nicer way. If we start our own personal internal dialogue, our own language inside our heads, if we work with our dialogue in, in that same format, okay, how am I going to talk to my dog? I don't want to be stern because he hasn't gone to that point. I want my dogs to understand that I'm being firm, that it's somewhat tough love, that it is a very focused statement. And I say, uh, uh, as an analogy, or even as an exercise, go to Costco and try to return something that you know you shouldn't actually be allowed to get a refund on, but you want to, you're hoping you're going to get that refund. So you always say, you know, there's nothing, uh, there's something, uh, I'm not really happy with this product um, and I don't want it. You're not going to say, I'm not really happy with this product, blah, blah, blah. Because we know the refund policy at Costco is quite generous. So it comes down to the part of, we want a refund and this is a reason why and I know I shouldn't be getting it but I still want it so we're going to kind of do the same thing with our dogs when we talk to them we want need to comply even though realistically we feel somewhat impotent because we're like does our dog even understand us and that's why I say we don't use if you don't to people don't use a lot of language when you're talking to your dog in the beginning especially so that they understand they listen to key words, key tones, key phrases. Uh, it's the same thing when you meet somebody who's a really slow talker and they're somewhat, uh, you know, not like they're dumb, right? Like not, not un, you know, uneducated, but someone who is educated, but they talk slowly, you know, professors and all that stuff. And they're like, and now, today, and you're like, why doesn't he hurry up? But we can't be rude and say, hurry up. A again, we want to, we want to just Make sure that everything's reciprocal. Okay, uh, Sammy writes, My dogs know by the tone of my voice. I don't coddle them if they need uh, correcting. True. Um, the, 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 right, your dogs, our dogs, all dogs, they learn the tone of, of our voices and the inflection and the level of uh, sincerity, uh, happiness, upset that we have with them when we're having conversations. That, that's why when we're having a regular conversational tone with our dogs, they're listening to that baseline at all times. And they're hearing it all the time. And it's that baseline, baseline, baseline that they can feel confidence in. And then from that is actually what I do is I end up creating uh, fluctuations and novel, uh, <coughs> excuse me, novel, novel, <coughs> excuse me, novel shifts uh, uh, to the way I, I, I speak it afterwards once they're familiar with my baseline of conversation. And that's what I call the voice key. And it comprises part of that voice key that our dog has that is that particular tone, that melody, that tone that they listen to that they know is part of our family, part of our life, part of things that they understand is indigenous to the way our family is together and how our conversation is and how we speak. And it's that voice key. And so when I talk about the baseline, I talk about a voice key at a level one up to a level 10. And for those spinal tap fans up to a level 11. Uh, so it is uh, just a, a base. And once I start getting into my podcasting, I will, it'll be a lot more structured because I'll have time to record and to edit and to, um, you know, create a bit more structure. So um, that is going to be actually um, next week. Next week, I'm getting my laptop. It's coming across uh, the well. It's coming to the border on the weekend. I'm sorry, on Tuesday. So hopefully Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll have it figured out. And then I have to order a bunch of cables that I didn't know I was supposed to order, um, because I don't know these things. I just assume that everything comes together in the old days that used to come together, but nowadays it's like apparently all the anyways. All right. So um, uh, the voice key. That's the thing. That's conversational tone. And what you want to do is you want to start with basic instructional words, a.k.a. command, action words. They're, they're action words, right? Instructional words, words that are really basic, that our dog can understand, that we understand the basic statement of our own word or words to our dog so that they themselves learn. And it's the same way we as children learned how to communicate trolling me on uh, one of my uh, live group sessions that I had uploaded to Facebook and they're big fans of Learberg who's this really mediocre treat trainer who 
has no idea what he's doing. And I say this because he literally went onto my YouTube channel and trolled me on it and criticized me openly and, and attacked me and said I didn't know and called me an idiot and everything like that. And I said, oh, really? Okay, well then, do you work with dangerous dogs? Do you do this, do that? Do you know how dogs process time? Do you know how this and this and that? And he had no answers for any of it. And then I said, and you buy your subscribers too. He's got like 40,000 subscribers, but he's bought them all because when I look at his video views, his video views, if you got 48,000 subscribers, or, or 40,000 plus, I, I remember. Uh, if you've got 40,000 plus subscribers, if you're putting out a video, you should get, and, and you should get like two, three, five, ten thousand, thirty thousand 10,000, 30,000 views. Instead, Lierberg is getting a thousand views after a couple of weeks, literally, on all his videos across the board. So that means he's bought his subscribers. Pretty sad. And then he has the audacity to come and criticize me and troll me. So I went, okay, fine. So somebody else who's a fan of Lierberg said, you must be a shittier trainer than I thought <laughs> if you don't know who Lierberg is. And so I totally, totally blew her away. And I basically said, you know what, Lierberg, you're right. Like I said earlier, Lierberg's a mediocre treat trainer. But I said that, um, you know, I've worked with extremely dangerous dogs. And I showed the media links in my posts as well. And um, uh, talk about Minky, who came from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. You know, the one dog out of 20,000 plus dogs that they, no one in Los Angeles could deal with. And I said, they asked me. They didn't ask Learberg. They know who Learberg is. They didn't ask Learberg. They asked me. And that's the situation where it comes to this part. Is that everyone watches my stuff who doesn't understand or, or have a, a, a interest or, or, or an affection for my work. So they don't understand what's going on. They think, oh, this guy's just doing crazy stuff and he doesn't know what he's doing. They don't realize I'm actually processing things at two-tenths of a second. I'm seeing way faster than they see. And they are so simplistic in their approach because they're used to treat training and bridging and all these other archaic aspects of it. As opposed to understanding that it's intuitive ability that we as human beings have. I developed all that I did intuitively. Because that's the way we grew up. That's the way we evolved. It was using our brain and learning it versus listening to somebody tell you something when they've already created a fraudulent presence themselves by buying. I just didn't like it. It just wasn't cool. It was that was that that you know. It, it's one thing to say, you know, what you did is not like Learberg to to comment. One thing would have been, hey, you know, your work is uh, not really accurate and blah blah blah. Like he could have said stuff like that. Out of even if though he was ignorant uh, and uneducated and unskilled, instead he went and started attacking me and calling me an idiot literally on there. So I went, okay, fine, dude. So people are gonna say, oh, you know, you should be professional, James, and you should not. Hey, you know what? I have the right to defend myself. I do. I have the absolute right to defend myself. And when someone who has, uh, uh, who has a following, him, who he himself has a, a large following, right? The bot subscribers and all that stuff and and so forth. When he has his people, his followers attacking me, when he does all these kinds of things and he's not abating, he's, he, 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 it's unabated, he, he, he doesn't stop, then I'm going to stand up and I'm going to defend myself and then I'm going to destructure his work. Um, and I just there. So I think uh, uh, actually another person, uh, Jade, uh, sent me a link to uh, that guy from Upstate Canine Academy who's training a dog. <laughs> Uh, a, 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 an aggressive dog that's muzzled, German Shepherd, and he's got a catch pole on him. And the views got like I think 1.3 million views already. And I'm looking at, it and I'm like, holy cow! Uh, and people, people, some people are like, oh my gosh, this guy, this trainer's amazing. This guy's amazing. That uh, right, the Upstate Canine Academy guy in New York. And I was like, no, he's not. He's using a catch pole on a muzzled dog that's wearing a prong collar. That's not an amazing trainer. That's a chicken beep trainer that's a trainer who doesn't know what he's doing at all and then he starts talking about battling and with the, 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 the German Shepherd is battling him and I'm like wow wow the dogs being you're creating a confrontation with this particular dog that the dog themselves does not know they're having a confrontation they don't know they're having a battle with you they're not acting that way they're just being a dog just like Chris Rock said, tigers being a tiger. A catch pole, Sammy, is what they use to catch dogs at the end of a long pole. Usually it's a 10-foot pole. 
and sometimes it extends longer and at the end of it has a noose or a wire noose a wire loop i mean and they can pull it at the back end so that when they pull whoops i'm doing the frame so when they pull it gets tight around like a slip uh, slip leash and then when they pull and then they can release it out to release the dog the catch pole is to protect the the animal control person from being attacked by the dog by keeping them away at a 10 foot pole haha <laughs> there's that saying so uh, that's why they say it wouldn't touch it with a, with, a, with a 10 foot pole. That's where the saying came from, I think. I'm just guessing. It just makes sense, right? Um, so this is what the guy's doing with a catch pole, and he's talking about battling off. Someone's like, wow, wow. If, you, if, if we already create a negative approach to something, we're, we're not just going to be. Anyways, I, I'm, I, I'm going to stop digressing. Um, uh, three of the most negative things around. Yes, Julie. Three of the most negative things around is what Julie writes. That's 100% true. It, it's just, it's it's so useless. I mean, the dogs I've worked with, uh, Nero from, uh, my beloved Nero from Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab Charity, the largest Great Dane Rescue in North America, between 80 to 110, usually around that median range, 80 to 100, 110, Great Danes in foster care at any given time. So that's a lot of Great Danes, and so they're, they're, they're nationwide in the United States, they're the largest, they're um, phenomenal. Nero came from uh, Amy's uh, Rescue Save Rocky, uh, and um, it just, I was just thinking of something because obviously Nero's passed away on June 11th of this year uh, at age 13 years, 7 months, uh, 1 week old. And I got him at 10 years, 4 months of age, and he had been caged for 7 years. He'd been chained up outside the next 3 years with a prong collar. Instead of weighing 140 pounds, he weighed 75 pounds, was dumped at the kill shelter. He was aggressive, obviously, you know, living outdoors for 3 years, plus breeding for 7 years before that. And uh, he, he was quite a dangerous dog. He tried to drag uh, prospective adopters up and over the fence of his foster's uh, property in to, to attack him. Uh, yeah, Amy's awesome. Uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Julie's. Um, so, and, and, and Nero had done that. Nero had pulled an adult off, a, a large adult off uh, the couch at the Foster's home in Alabama um, and dragged uh, her onto the floor. He, he literally grabbed her by the arm and she was just sitting there and he grabbed her and yanked her off the couch into the center of the living room floor. And then he proceeded to attack her, causing wounds uh, that required 67, 6, 7, 67 stitches. And you can ask Amy, uh, Julie, about that. Um, and he, you know, again, he nipped me, he grabbed me by the top of the head one time. I've, I've talked about, and there's lots of other things that I never said, and I, and I never mentioned when, while he was still alive. Um, just because then people have this negative feeling. He, obviously, an extreme resource guarder uh, of everything. And couldn't be touched below the neck, all that stuff. I didn't use a catch pole, not a, not a catch pole. Even the first day that I got him from the airport, I, I, I approached him in a certain way. I was very quiet and, and, and polite and nice to him and respectful and uh, used the, the nice conversational tones with him and just spent some time with him just so he could understand that I would be safe for him and he would be safe with me. And... Um, uh, didn't need to use a catch pole. Uh, that's one thing for sure is no muzzle, no shock, nothing, right? But that's me though. I'm, I have a really unique gift. I'm kind of like the Bruce Lee of dog training and dog psychology. I was watching some Bruce Lee stuff last night um, for inspiration. Uh, and, you know, obviously Bruce uh, Lee was a, a, an incredible idol for every young boy and especially for Asian uh, boys and and girls too. My my sisters were all like that, uh, and uh, thought Bruce Lee was amazing. I mean, good looking guy. It's absolutely amazing. He could do two finger push ups with just like that, doing two finger push ups. Uh, he could hold a seventy five pound weight uh, at arm's length like that. He could hold at arm's length for uh, for several minutes at a time. He, uh, I thought he would. I thought he could punch five times in a second, but apparently he was clocked at punching nine times in a second. And he could kick five times in a second. And if you watch those videos, they actually say in the in, in those old videos from the seventies uh, that the film was wasn't the 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 the, uh, the technology the film technology wasn't there that he would kick so fast that the film 
the 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 cameras, the, the movie cameras, the film cameras could not even catch the kick. It would happen so fast, and people would fall. They said people would fall, but the camera wouldn't catch it because he was that fast. And we're talking thirty-two frames a second. So the person would fall, and they're like, "What? What?" So they told him to slow down. And this is when he was uh, in the Green Hornet, and they told him to slow down down so that it looked like a blur and they still couldn't catch it slowed down all it looked like was a blur he was still that fast and that's at 32 frames a second in those old days right when they were shooting film and all that so um you know he was seen as uh, uh reading uh, sorry he was seen as um uh, um responding uh, his his reaction time was two tenths of a second and so um i'm of a second and obviously anyone who's ever worked with me knows that uh, my accuracy is there uh, but yeah so anyhow uh, that was about Nero always use regular conversation I never used a catch pole never used anything at all you uh, know I think it took me uh, seven months and I could actually put my face right beside his face when he was eating a raw beef bone and um, I could take it away from him as well I could pretend to eat it yuck um, and I could do all these things with Nero and I sent it actually if you ask uh, a Amy at Save Rocky I sent the videos to her and she's like that's unbelievable like after seven months no resource guarding uh, my friends could walk him my friends could uh, feed him and everything like that when I was uh, when I was working on my own business at the time another business um, and so I always talked to Nero in a regular way and I didn't have to use anything at all. And I think uh, for me, maybe I have a different type of bravery or courage. Um, but I also look at the fact that I don't have a, I, I'm not going to victimize a, a dog further so um, than, than is necessary. But yeah, anyhow, um, um, Mary had said earlier, I don't mean being mean, just letting him know I'm not happy with his actions. And that's correct. Yes, that's correct. Um, Um, yeah, so yeah, we just want to be firm, but even when we are firm in the beginning, we want to start at a level one because we got there's no use going to a five out of ten. There's no use. We want to start at just the base level, at the base tone of voice when we're having the conversation with our dog because then even if we're upset, we just raise it up to like a, a volume, a voice key, two. Right, we just raise it up a little bit so they can hear. Because when we raise it up, there's more volume. It's a bit different in the strain and the tone of voice. Right, how our vocalization makes a shift. People who've worked with me know that I'm always listening to the way they're talking. I can hear their inflections and all that stuff. And that again is happening at two tenths of a second. And then people stop talking around me. So, um, and I say no, no, no. We just keep talking and all that. Uh, but um, we just want to have conversational tones with our dog. So we, we start with basic instructional words, as I was saying earlier, as I love to digress. And once I do the podcast, it won't be as bad. So those of you who are following me with a bag of popcorn, I, I thank you so much. Um, so we start with basic instructional words, right? As I said, AKA commands, also known as action words. And later on, I'll call them conversational words, right? Which is the same thing. We are using the same words we use to teach our children. So again, if our, if our if our child, if we're watching someone's child or we have a child and they're in the house, in the kitchen, and we've just cooked dinner, right? I'm using the same analogy, so it just reinforces. I can use different examples, but I want to use the same analogies. So I just keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it and pounding it in. So that way, eventually, when I do create a variation to that, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then I add color by creating different variations of that same uh, uh, analogy, and then you go, oh, oh, now I hear the difference in what he's talking about because now he's, me, ha has added to it, basically. And so then you start to expand what you learn. That's how I learned with my dogs, <laughs> with Nero, uh, with Walter, with uh, uh, William. Uh, I, I learned it over time by uh, the exposure. But again, my exposure was 24 hours, seven days a week uh, for weeks and months at a time. And it was baby steps, really, really tiny, tiny baby steps. And so I learned those little analogies and I learned how to, uh, in the beginning, I wasn't great with my voice, didn't understand it as well. I knew I had to be uh, firm and then I was able to start understanding that sim uh, simpatico, uh, that symbiotic uh, connection, that yin and yang that I had with 
whichever dog that I was working with, especially in the beginning, even like the Minky uh, issue, who's extremely skittish, to Nero, who's an old 10 year plus dog when I get him, who everyone says can't be helped ever because he's too dangerous and he's too old. And well, you know what? There, right? So it's it's easy. Well, I shouldn't say easy. It's easy for me, yes. It's straightforward to do, and it's straightforward that I am teaching people how to do it. And the biggest thing is always making sure that our tone of voices is there. We want to use those same words that uh, with our dogs when we're giving them commands, giving them action words, right? Instructions. We want to use the same words as we would with a child. So if you, and these are examples of the words, and I'll use three examples, or I'll do like the Germans do. Uh, we'll do three words, uh, um, which is stop, go, wait. W-A-I-T. Stop, go, wait. And I do hand signals. I mean, we can, we can do hand signals as well. We can do a whole bunch of things to train our dogs so that we don't have to give them a command verbally. We can do hand signals, right? And, and I, I do that. This is for a stop or stay. And, and then, um, uh, what did I do? I, I can't remember one I did for uh, to have a dog uh, a recall command. I can't remember what it was. I think I did that one, right? Like like this one where I go, come, right? And that one, and then I did a release command. And actually, I'll tell you what I do for a release command is this, right? Oh, sorry, it's this way. And it's, it's doing this quickly like a wagging tail. I don't do it up. I do it down this way. And I do it that way because of the uh, relation, the contextual relation of that lower wagging tail that has to do with the subconscious processes of the dog and how they interpret that lower tail wag. And the tell behavior that you see in these idiots out there are saying all these things like the dog is this and that and, and, and talking about things and how, you know, I saw that one video where that one guy pointed out about this one particular trainer. Uh, they're talking about the dog's tail is only wagging at the top and not at the base and stuff like that. I'm like, uh, and he's talking, I can't remember what he was saying about it. He's like, oh, he's really relaxed or whatever. I'm like, no, he's not relaxed or whatever. I don't remember what he said. And I was just like. No, this, I just remember saying, no, that's not right. And I was doing that on a live vlog, too. And the guy, uh, and I was like, yeah, no, he's, he, he's this, this person's wrong. And tell behavior again. So I do that release on that end. And I don't do this release and go, release, or blah, 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 blah. I use this as any type of acknowledgement to the dog so that either they're doing something good or that um, they're whatever uh, thing that they're doing, you know, if they're sitting or not sitting, if they're standing somewhere waiting for me, then I do the release and then they come over to me, right? That's a hand signal thing. You know, I would just pick out your own, if you're going to do hand signals with your dog, just figure out your own hand signals and do it yourself. Do it intuitively. Don't follow what the industry teaches you or wants you to learn because they're wrong. And why follow what 60% success rate of the, this industry, uh, you, you know, why follow the blind? Don't worry about the hand signals. Do the hand signals that you intuitively think, and you will see that other people who do hand signals themselves intuitively have done it themselves. They, you will see that sometimes <laughs> that you're both doing similar hand signals intuitively. And you're like, oh, how did that happen? Well, it's right here, evolution. In intuitively you we know why the dog's tail wags to the bottom we know why i know why the dog's tail wags to the why they do a swoosh sometimes why they do some uh, of a, a movement where the tail's up or, or down right it doesn't matter when the tail's up and it moves to one side you know it's how that sometimes the dog wags and then they go like this and then they go back like that it's incredibly communicative it's incredible what our dogs are saying when they're doing that, it's reflective of their conscious and subconscious processing. It's absolutely awesome. And I know exactly what it all means when they're actually cognitively processing or they're emotionally processing and what they're thinking when they create a conclusion in their statement in their brain of what's happening by the position of their tail wagging. And same with that part. There's one that I do a video with Bruno uh, the the uh, the uh, Saint Bernard he he's 180 pounds I think or 170 pounds a really cute little guy never been around dogs since he was kicked out of doggy daycare because he was bigger than the other dogs and then they said he got into a fight well they another dog fought with 
Bruno, and then taking him out. And then they couldn't take Bruno to anyone else because when you say, oh, yeah, I want to bring my dog to daycare. Oh, have you ever been to daycare? You have to say yes, right, truthfully or whatever. And then they say, has your dog been in a fight? And they say, yeah, Bruno's been in a fight at the doggy daycare. And then, of course, the next daycare is going to say, well, we are not going to take him either. But in the video with him and Walter and Lincoln and Nero, there's a point where a fight does break out. Almost. Well, it, it does. It, there's an engagement of a fight. And then uh, after I break it up, because I have to kick one, uh, I have to stomp one away at the back of the hip. And then as they break up and then Bruno comes walking back towards camera uh, and, and his parents are filming on my phone for me. And he's walking back towards camera and uh, his tail swooshes in a, not a figure eight, but in a, uh, like those ribbons, you know, those, uh, those ribbons. Right? Sorry, I have to watch myself here. Um, so that's a tell behavior anyhow. Yeah. Anyhow, you know, what, here's the thing is, as you follow my path and you see and hear what I'm talking about and as I gets more formalized and I start creating the nuances in, in, in regards to what I've learned, you're going to start learning how to read your own dog. But not the point of reading your own dog, but actually seeing them in their processes. And I said this to somebody yesterday, a, a, a client, um, that the more you do that and the more you're paying attention to your dog and the more that you're anticipating and you're addressing issues that will potentially happen will not maybe but will potentially happen you'll start paying more attention you'll start seeing things and your intuition will start picking it up which is the uh, actual aspect of what bridging is intermediate bridging and terminal bridging it's actually your intuition but you'll see that starting to, de to develop um, and that's something else complex there. Okay, well, I better I better get back to to, to this thing here. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so stop, go, wait, and I call them conversational tones, and these are again, uh, sorry, conversational words, and these are words you want to use uh, any kind. You, you you can talk to your family, figure out which words you want to all agree on, because it has to be consistent across the board. Your 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 husband, your wife. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your son, your daughter, your grandma, your grandpa, your friends, your neighbors, everything. They have to use the same language, the same words that you're using, especially in the beginning when you're training your dog so that they understand and that there's consistency and they understand conversation. They understand those words. I mean, if you're sitting with some people and they use some word like troglodyte, which I used the other day, and you're like, oh, that's an odd word, blah, 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 blah. And then you're, you're out somewhere else and then you hear the word used by somebody else, troglodyte, and you're like, oh, that's a that's an interesting word, troglodyte. And then you, da-da-da, you're watching TV and you're like, Trog you heard, and the newscaster's going, da-da-da-da-da, troglodyte, and you're like, troglodyte, what? What's, what's that word? T-R-O-G, not troglodyte. Oh, no, I can't remember. Okay, I can't remember how to spell it right now, uh, a little bit of stage fright, but it is essentially a cave person, a caveman, right, a Neanderthal. Uh, so that's what the word means. Like I learned that when I was a kid, um, just because, you know, you know how kids try to show off with each other. That's before internet. We would read books and dictionaries and stuff like that, and encyclopedias to see who was smarter or, or knew better, more words. And then, uh, so I learned troglodyte. Um, anyways, and that's just stuck to me because it was such an interesting way to call someone a, a cave person without them realizing that they, but you, they, they know you're insulting them when you call them a troglodyte. It's one thing to say Neanderthal, you know, right. people are like, yeah, I'm used to that word, but troglodyte, that's, that's a bit more of a sophisticated word and people have to look it up. <laughs> and if they don't know how to spell it, like I've hit that, that wall of how to spell it today. Uh, I think it's T-R-O-G-L-Y, deal troglodyte. No, uh, troglodyte. Dy. Uh, anyways, okay. I'm not. I'm gonna give up. I'm not. I'm gonna stop trying. Um, I'll remember how to spell it after I have uh, finished this record. This uh, this broadcast. Um, so yeah. Okay. So yeah, use regular words that your kids use that you would use with your children when you're teaching them how to be safe. When you're teaching your children how to do things, you want to use the same words consistently across the board. Because when you're using the same words across the board, like troglodyte, you hear the word more and more and more, right? It's reinforcement. That's the crude application of it. But it's your adaptive brain. Our adaptive brain is learning. 
right? Primal. So what they call it, like, they call it reinforcement, but they, uh, these, these, the, the industry doesn't understand. They're just, they're like little, like I said, they're like kids on a tricycle with two wheels. There's, there's reinforcement. It's, but it's an adaptive behavior. It's a human, it's an evolutionary, it's an animal, it's an evolutionary behavior. It's adaptive by learning and seeing and picking up things that causes us to be curious. Curiosity stems from fear or creates fear. Defensive measures is where fear comes from, right? Because you're defensive if you're going to get attacked by a, a bear or a bear, a bear. I would love to have a beer right now. Um, if you got attacked by a bear, you would be defensive and you have fear, right? And then you learn how to escape from the bear. Even if you try to climb up a tree, hopefully the bear is evolutionary. It's not reinforcement. But then again, I see things. See, so what it is when I look at the way I work with dogs and animals like alpacas and in and, and other words, and I've uh, helped people, a couple people with their cats too, you know, meow, meow. Um, when... when when we look past the surface of how we are labeling dog behavior, then we we have the reason to learn more and we have the reason to explore more and investigate more with our dogs. If we say we're just reinforcing the dog with whatever it is, using reinforcement, it's like, oh, reinforcement. Well, the dog's, here you go, that's it. Okay, all right, uh, see you later, bye. But when we look at the fact that we're not reinforcing the dog, but we're addressing his adaptive or our his, her adaptive behavior, understanding that our dog is learning and understanding that there's a predatorial behavior and survival, Darwin, Darwinism. When we, when I, that's how I perceive, that's how I look at dogs this way. This is their behavior. It's adaptive. It's not in reinforcement. It's not luring. It's anticipation. It's following. It's strategizing. It's analytical. When I do that, not only do I create a greater respect for all dogs, I create a personal interest to look into the complexity of my dog's or anybody else's dog's emotional context and cognitive processing. And actually, with emotional context and cognitive processing, we can determine the level of intelligence that a dog has. A dog IQ, which I call DIQ. And no, I'm not saying it that way. But you know what? Now you guys all have an excuse to say the word dick. D-I-Q. Okay? Dog intelligence quotient. And that's something I've, I've been uh, working on for a little bit. And that's what my 100-plus uh, uh, questionnaire with dog behavior issues um, is rooted in. That will allow me not to only ascertain each individual dog's dysfunctions to a very key point, but also to determine the level of intelligence that your particular dog has. I have dogs here that are quite intelligent. I have dogs that are emotionally intelligent. I have dogs that have a analytical processing, but they lack the emotional intelligence to create the uh, impetus to uh, complete their thought process or their action process. And I have dogs that are not as intelligent. And I have dogs that are emotionally uh, um, uh, 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 complex. as we, we go down this path, but um, I just got to make sure I don't go too complicated here. I do that by putting the dog on a equal footing, equal level with me, means that I m must learn to understand that this dog at psychological complexity of this dog, not just because I'm wanting to prove anything, I'm wanting to help heal this dog, and I have to do so by talking to the dog in conversational, regular tones, right? Again, if a dog's dysfunctional, a dog's been hurt, victimized, and all that stuff, talking down to the dog is not going to help the dog understand that he's part of the family when you talk to the rest of the family. Hi, honey, how are you? Are you home now? Hi, honey, hi, right? You, you see the difference? That's why everything has to come from all these little structures, all these little, little nodules modules uh, all these nodes all these modules they're, they're it's all got to come up together and then as we get it together it all becomes one functioning component the brain right that's what we're talking about quantum that's an aspect of processing that's how i see dogs is it's a quantum format obviously 
But we take all these little modules and we start taking all these little pieces together and we start putting the puzzle together, then we get the whole picture. I've already learned how to figure out how to get the whole picture of a dog. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Anyways, I'm so easily distracted. I learned how to do the whole picture of the dog and their processing and their behavior from all these little nodes and modules and little nuances and behaviors that we do it which is their personality which is their psychological profile which is what humans have as well you me oh wait me you we all have it so that's the what i keep talking about in regards to breaking down dog behavior at two tenths of a second and humans can do it too I'm just trying to fix my little screen here okay all right so um use conversation Toddler's comprehension level. And the easiest way to do is look at YouTube videos. Human YouTube videos. Where there's two, three-year-old children. And, and you, I tell people who have above average intelligent children or different emotional based type. Uh, sorry, children. Uh, dogs. Different emotional type based dogs or logic based dogs. Depending on their structure and their personality. I will tell uh, some people. I will say go to YouTube and look at uh, this video or that video, whatever it is. But in this case, for example, for, for children here, um, I say to them, go look at YouTube videos of uh, how to teach a child to talk. So that's like a one to two year old age range, right? Look at a child videos of how to teach them to talk and what words to use. And words like stop, go, Wait is a bit more com waiting, waiting for something. W a i t waiting. Is a, uh, waiting is a bit more of a complex word. It's kind of like jealousy as an emotion for dogs. It's a bit more complex. The word wait is a bit more complex for a dog to understand. And we'll get to that path, uh, you know, as we move forward um, in this. So um, yeah, so stop, go, and wait. I call these, uh, and these are conversational words. So the the, the conversational words at a toddler's comprehension level. That's why I say look at the videos, right? I'm not I'm not selling any videos. I hope I really really hope that I never have to ask uh, for money uh, to run my website or to uh, do my videos or whatever it is. I mean, who knows what will happen in the future, but I just anyways, um it's my dream. But uh, uh you you'll see as we go on forward anyways. Um so use conversational words that would be processed by toddler, uh, like a two, one to two year old child when you're teaching them the basic words and you can use a bit more complex words or emotion or you can use a bit more emotion with those words at a, as you would to a two to three year old child. So I have to remember not to say dog or child or well, I'm confusing, but as a two to three year old child, then you want to use that type of tone and emotional context, language, the inflection, the cadence, the rhythm of what you're saying at a two to three year old child level. But you're using one to two year old um, conversational words that you're teaching, right? Mom, dad, stop, go, right? A little bit more complex, right? But we, we are going to tell our kids. Right, you know, even a baby crawling towards a, a a fireplace that's really hot. What is our first? Even if it's a baby, what do we say? We're like, no, 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 stop, stop. Wait, wait, wait. Right. So we just use logic, right? Common sense, conversational tones, words to hod toddlers. It's it's that part. Um. So, and I think I'm gonna start my vlog bro uh, podcast broadcast. Uh, talking about conversation and why conversation is an extremely important ingredient, foundation for every single dog that I've ever worked with. Not just the physical, not the, the, the voice key, the, the conversation. That is the most crucial connection that we can have to a lifetime of trust. So when we're using these basic conversational words, uh, right, action words that I call them, I don't want to use the word commands or, you know, obedience or whatever. I call it, again, regular language. If I'm using regular language with my dog, if I'm saying, you know, I'm going to use, uh, 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 I'm just going to tell my dog to stop, as opposed to say I'm going to give my dog an order, you're going to hear yourself thinking about your dog differently, right? An order means that you're an authority, that you are above your dog in in the sense of it in the point of 
somewhat a disenfranchisement from your dog's connection to you because you're ordering that means you're still pulling in that power card right the 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 human control over the dog card right i'm not going to call it the dominant thing or the alpha thing and all so like i said it's just a misnomer and it's so uh, it's incorrect and immature but we want to use um anyways okay <laughs> sorry uh i just i, I gotta i gotta finish this um so with words like stop, wait, go, always use it in the same tone in the beginning. Go, right? Go. I use go. And go is an action word, right? It's a verb. It's an action word. It's a direction. It's a command. It's just like you recall a dog. Come here. It's Right? Okay. So what it is, is I start with a base word, such as go, and then the dog learns to understand over time, over repetitive, consistent training, right? Uh, uh, supervision is using the word go. Uh, uh, go Zevia, Zevia go. That's it, right? Just using the basic word. Not a lot else, especially in the beginning, because again, we want to have consistency. We don't want to have extraneous talk when we're trying to instruct our dog. So it's go Zevia. And then when the dog understands go as an action word, means that the dog has understood in a sentient format, the dog has understood the word go as being complex, as being more than just go, more than just a release word, more than just an action, uh, sorry, more than just a, a command word. The dog learns to understand. Our dogs start to think what that word means and what it, the roundness of that word that it, impl it, it, it implicates even more. It, it indicates and implicates even more than just that. See how exciting, like to me this is super exciting because I see the fact that dogs, I can teach them words and that they can learn what those words mean and not only can they learn what those words mean, they can understand by putting the words together. And it's kind of like what you talk about those speech pathologists and so forth like that that they're doing and then teaching the dog how to structure sentences and all that stuff. What, like, you know, there's that video of the person, uh, Australia, or New Zealand, Australia, who uh, was on CNN, uh, just by coincidence, I was watching CNN for the political mayhem that's going on in the, uh, currently. But uh, they had an art, uh, a video about a dog where, where a speech pathologist taught her dog with a bunch of uh, little buttons all over the place, uh, like in a row, and each word, each button meant each word, right? Meant a word, and then the dog would learn to structure the words together. <laughs> you know, I, I watched it, and I, I will say yes, because uh, I'm talking about the same thing. But there's going to be a divergence, right? A divergence on what I see. And what she, 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 she doesn't understand that she structured the complexity of the words. Right, so she created a pattern for the dog to 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 adapt to, but she didn't cause the dog to think. And even though she, there's the ones where the the dog is worried about something, and like I like I need help or whatever it is, it's it's not. You just have to watch the video. Maybe when I get the podcast, I'll, I'll dig it up and find it somewhere and then put it in once I learn how to edit and clip. Um, but the 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 buttons when she, the dog. And it wasn't, it, this, it wasn't, this is what it's, oh, I don't know if I should say it in an, okay. So say, for example, the dog presses the button that says, go outside, right? Um, instead of the button, she, the dog, her dog pressing the button and the, and the word says, and the, you hear it go, you know, it, it basically comes out like, and go outside. It's like, it's, it's, it's electronic and it's cheap electronic sounding words. So that way the dog doesn't even hear anything. And and because it's not with a human voice, there's no inflection because it's electronic. Then it, what happens is instead of it having a broader, wider, deeper, higher envelope of of, of the, the spectrum, of, of uh, the sound spectrum, it's, it's this small. It's this narrow. Go outside. Whereas we say, go outside. So she she's like eighty percent there. I don't mean to be such a jerk and criticize everybody and all that stuff. I'm not saying that she's it's just 
the or is this that little bit more, Brian? We got to come in from the other other perspective or understanding. So, all right. Um, but anyway, so the dog is pressing all these buttons and all that stuff and saying conversationally how how to do this stuff, but uh, is able to structure right and is, is even though the dog is trained and it's a trained behavior that the dog is actually doing. Context of the dog in some points, but not truly. So what we want to do is when we use the word, when I use the word such as go, g o go, I use that in general for every movement forward, everything, right? If, if I am, you know, walking and we're stopped at a at an intersection, I always stop my dogs at an intersection. Always, it doesn't matter if there's nobody there and it's pitch uh, it, it doesn't matter I always stop at an intersection just to teach my dog that I'm looking to make sure there's no cross traffic and also to address aspects of potential uh, potentially getting hit by a car if they're loose if they've run loose or whatever um, but okay so using the word go so it, it's if they're in the kitchen I want them to leave I'm gonna say go and I'm gonna use that word again and I'm gonna walk them out I'm gonna use my body and walk them out and then they they try to get around me, and I just I, I deke them out, and then I just walk them out of the kitchen. And I and then what ends up happening is we start creating a complexity. Once the dog runs the word go, they understand it's an action. If I'm waiting to let them uh, go outside to go to the bathroom, I'll wait for them, uh, and I always and like I said, I let them out seniority wise, and then I will say to to like for example Zevia, I'll say go Zevia, so Zevia knows her name. And then she understands, and here's the word go. And it's go there when she goes outside. If she's in the kitchen, go. I'll walk her out of the, right? So she understands the word go. It's a movement. It's an action word. It's a decisive word. It commands action. Physical action on the dog. And then as the dog gets more and more proficient with it, then I create a complexity to the word go by adding on an additional word. You, you right so then I create the second word and so for example I can teach my dogs to go left oops uh, okay I don't know which way the camera showing so, this is my left so I can teach uh, the dog to go left I can teach the dog go right I can teach the dog go straight or go forward I can teach the dog go backwards go back so once once my dog learns the word go as an action word, then I add it on by creating a, a complexity to that structure. So then I, again, so if I say go left, the dog knows, okay, it's an action word. Which way is what What's left? I don't, I've never heard this word before. And so what I do is when I get to a place where I'm going to go left, I say go left, and then I give the dog a quick tug. Or else if I, he doesn't know what's going on, I'll have to pull him a little bit. But most often, you know, dogs adapt immediately to the movement of the leash. So then the, he goes left. So where's the walking? Da da da. Go left, and like oh oh okay. The dog learns. Go left. Go left. The dog learns. Go back. Like for example, so with Zevia, if she's in the kitchen, and I'm making their dinner, right, and then we don't want the big crowd there, because they all they, I mean they're so big they get you know they're all standing like this high uh, actually right here. So then I will tell them to go out or go back, and I'll walk them back, and then so then I start saying. Go back, go back, go back, and I'll push them back with my body. I'll walk them back. I'll walk them right into them, and I'll walk them back. If they're a small little dog, same thing. I'll, I'll, I'll sweep them gently, not hard. I'll sweep them gently backwards and say, go back, go back, go back. I'm not going to say, you got to get out of the kitchen and go back. No, go back only. Just two words, go back. Then the dog hears the word go that they've already learned as an action word, in every circumstance and they understand that it's a physical action because they're put into motion the word go they understand that then I teach him the direction left so then the dog learns the action and direction F for for go left right I mean for others other things it's different right that's why I say this is so complex that's why I say academia doesn't know what they're doing because they haven't looked at any of this stuff here they don't care because they think the dog's dumb but then I teach the dog, go left. So then, what, what, oh, I wonder if, okay. Um, so, go left, and then I'll give him a tug, go left. And then if I go uh, to the right, then I'll say, go right. 
and I'll pull it and I'll give a quick tug on the leash. And it gets to the point, if you do it often enough, the dog understands the direction, go left, go right, by our movements. Just like that dog in Australia that is pressing those buttons, right? They, they kind of learn it by routine, by root, rote, by root, rote, R-O-T-E, by rote. <laughs> the dog learns it, right? So again, it's that training side of things. Then I get to the point where I teach them to go left or to go right. Okay, so if I teach my dog to go left, then they get to a point where they're proficient enough and they understand it that I don't have to tag or tug on the leash anymore. So then the dog goes, oh, go, go, oh, oh, what left? And they start to think about it. And they're, it's right because their, their level of cognition is, is, is not as sophisticated as our human. So they're kind of like, you can, you can see kind of the fog. They're like, uh, what? I understand go left, but usually there's a direction telling me, or, or there's a there's a movement on the leash telling me which way to go, and then I create a reinforcement because then I'll say go left, and then if I see a little confusion, then I'll tag them afterwards, right? So that's that intermediate bridging thing, right? Um, it's intuition because then I'll watch the dog and I'll see which way they're looking, and if they and and then if they're looking confused again, I will follow up with a, a tag on the on the leash. Um, but I watch for the way they're processing. And if the dog starts to move towards the left side, I'll encourage them and I'll say, good boy. And then the dog's like, oh, okay. Because then what I'm doing is I'm re reinforcing, right? You know, right? I'm, 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 I'm Lincoln. 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 Okay. That's outside. Lincoln, Lincoln, stop. Lincoln. Lincoln, Lincoln, stop yelling. Lincoln, stop yelling. Lincoln, stop yelling. Thank you. And he's he's on the other side of the wall. So it's just two words: stop, action word, yelling, a command, a, 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 an action word. I I, I kind of lost uh, a little bit. Um, but stop yelling, right? So the two words, uh, and you saw it, now he stopped. I didn't have to get up. I had to raise my voice, maybe to voice key three. And then after he follows through and stopped, then I thank him because he's complying. He's following my orders, my request, my conversation to stop yelling. If you're having a conversation with somebody, you know, with your friend, and they're talking like this, so like all of a sudden you're like, why are you raising your voice so loud? <laughs> but if you know the person and your friend really well, and they're like, la, 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 you're like, stop yelling. <laughs> and they're like, oh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it. Right, just regular conversation, intuitive, right? Follow that same thing. So again, uh, teaching the dog to go left, go right, etc., cetera, um, is, is easy. And then as, it, t it will take a long time because for us, we're not sophisticated enough. We're expecting instant results. We're expecting a treat-trained response to our command but we're just doing go left go right directional aspects of that with a verb and the and the uh, conjugation i think it is the <laughs> adverb lincoln it's just a truck lincoln 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 so you can hear the huffing in the background there because he's controlling himself emotionally that's why he's barking but he's controlling himself and that's what is brilliant about dogs so um uh, anyways, so going to teach a dog left and right will take a long time for most people. It takes a long time for me too. So it is not an easy thing to do if uh, if you're not ex it's it, it, well it's easy to train and teach your dog this if you're not in a rush for your dog to learn their left and their right. And that's on a directional side. And then and then of course you can start getting more sophisticated by you know. Give me your left paw. Give me your right paw, which is essentially what people are doing anyways with treats, right? Or or uh, whatever um, training that they're doing. That you know, give me your left paw, and the dog hears left paw, and then you know the same action or whatever physical indications from us. Uh, Mary writes, funny thing, all my Danes look like they are bow bowing when I ask them if they want to go outside. It's stretching. I think it's a Dane thing. Uh, actually, uh, Mary, a lot of dogs um, do the bowing, right? They call it the play bow, which is 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 
is not correct. People don't understand what the uh, there's two there's there's variations of bowing, right? Right, when the dog brings down, kind of like the downward dog thing, right? There's there's variations of it, and the, and the two primary ones are one is an anticipatory preparatory behavior, and then the other one is a uh, is a uh, uh, used as a um, an engagement sparring kind of an engagement. So there's a two aspects of play bowing. So the one that you're talking about with your dog, uh, your Danes, I mean, sorry, Mary, the ones that you're talking about with your Danes are the the anticipatory, be, preparatory behavior. That's what the play bow, or the, I'm sorry, play bow, or the bowing means versus the other part of it, which is um, uh, a sparring. Um, anyways, okay, so I don't, I better not digress because I'm, mm, mm, Okay, so uh, so you can teach a dog left, right, and all that stuff. And um, same with the word no. I, I, I do that with the word no, and that becomes the word that you teach a child as well to understand the word no. No. Do you want that? Can I have this, mommy? No, you can't. And then it comes to no. <laughs> it's like... So we teach our dogs the same way, those same basic words. And no is the same one. And... and no is a is a complex word for a dog to understand because we're using the word no as a corrective measure to an unwanted behavior minky thank you minky uh, we're using the word minky thank you minky we're using minky we're using the word no as a corrective behavior to to correct the behavior right it's no no, don't do this. No, right? It's 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 that. So, um, no, no works in a lot of ways. So, for one example, no is is another way of saying leave it, right? And the word leave it, right? The dog starts to pick up something that's like a a discarded chicken bone on the on you know. A diff, yeah, a, a, a discarded chicken bone littered on the on the sidewalk, and then your dog starts to go to go eat it, and you know if one off the bat it's it's discarded, so who knows what's in it? And second is if it's a cooked chicken bone or any kind of cooked bone, it will be sharp and splintered and can potentially kill your dog by getting inside their system and poking and and laser and cutting them up inside, right? So the lacerations and all that stuff. Um, but it is. Uh, that word, that the phrase, leave it. We tell the dog, leave it. Leave it. But we teach the dog the word no in the same tone and format. The dog understands and that no means not leave it as per se, but no means to discontinue an unwanted behavior regardless of its context. So if the dog is about to pick up, your dog is about to pick up the bone, We, I say, oh, my dog, should I say that? If my dog's about to pick up a bone, like Zevia's going to go pick up a bone, I say to Zevia, no, Zevia, no. When we get to that complexity. But it's been, and when it starts off, it's no, Zevia, leave it. Then it becomes no, Zevia. Then it becomes no, Right, we, we look at the word no, no is is, is what, point uh, 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 one five of a second, fifteen one hundredths of a second to say no, that's it. And but how many times have you met people who say words no, no? How many times have I said no, no, no? That's almost one in the third of a second long. No, different ways of saying no. So instead of saying no, Zevia, leave it. It's no or no you'll create the adaptation anyways I, I i'm just running out of time i'm so sorry everybody i just got sidetracked again and it's a friday wow what a great party night for me on a friday dogs no drop it if they picked up something they shouldn't yeah yeah it's totally cool so 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 just add uh, sammy which is great with what i'm talking about um just add some complexity to it by adding on an additional word phrasing to it so then if you were to say no drop it then they hear no drop it and then it gets to no and then they learn that sooner and faster so you, you, it, you, you'll see what I mean 
Um, and, and Sammy, I, I did see the post on your Facebook. I'm not, I haven't been on Facebook very much. Uh, just, um, it's just, uh, I've been a bit busy and I apologize, but, uh, Sammy, you know, um, my condolences, uh, to the, your memory, um, and all that stuff. And, uh, and, uh, as well, Mary, um, with the passing of your mom, um, as well. Uh, okay. So just, just figure out. If, if you look at the fact that your dogs are simple, like children, two, three-year-old children, and they can comprehend and they have the capacity to learn basic toddler words, learn how to speak to them that way. Learn how to use those words with them in that format so that they learn as if they were a toddler. But keeping in mind that they're predators and they can rip the head off of a, of a squirrel in a few seconds. Right? I know, I know it's kind of like, ah, whatever, but it is the fact that, again, you look, you're dealing with a dog, you know, you're dealing with an animal, a predator, predacious, it's just whatever, okay, uh, all right, um, yeah, and, and actually what I just said here in my, my description is, teaching no at first is mostly misses, then you get a few hits with the word no, and then as you do it more and more often, as you pay attention more and more often, then it gets to a point where your dog hears the word no, and they start putting it together. Same thing if, if, if uh, you know, the, the noisy one who was barking just now twice, I can use the word N-O with his name because I don't want, especially when I'm in a group of other dogs, then I can use his name, but I will say N-O, and then he hears it as opposed to the uh, stop barking one, right? To Zeta. Um, okay. Um and for those of you who are already using um, uh, what you call it, uh, classical commands already, like sit, stay, and etc., or, or or leave it and, and drop it, right? If you're already doing that and you want to transition them to just the word no, like I was saying, right, uh, Sammy? Then what you'll do is you'll actually start to use the word no, like I was saying earlier, in your conversation with her when you're giving her instructions no drop it or drop it no you start using that word same thing like the word troglodyte you you put it into your sentence but you keep your sentence as 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 uh, as efficient and as minimal as possible when you're talking to them so I, I talk a lot i talk forever and i go off on tangents and everything like that but when i'm with my dogs anyone's dog i am talking to them with just the right amount and I'm not speaking over and over and begging them or whatever. I'm talking to them in the language that I need them to hear me, which is conversational human language. And then they start to learn. And so you can say, no, drop it. Or you can say, drop it, no. And then you eventually say, no. Because then they start hearing it. It's the same way how you teach a uh, dog their a new name as well. Oh, they do no, no, and stop. So try just using no and their name. Whoever's about to pick it up. Right. Try that no and drop it if you and see how it works. Right. And, and I mean, I think you have a Chihuahua, right, Sammy? So <laughs> the Chihuahua never listens to anybody. And, you know, I put up two. I've shared two posts of people of, of other posts where, where the Chihuahuas are getting a bad rap, <laughs> a bad rep for being so uh, uh, angry and, and vicious <laughs> sometimes. And they're like this big. They're like this. They're so cute. They're so tiny. I actually thought of getting a Chihuahua, Sammy. I, I, a couple of years ago, but now it's just I wouldn't be able to find find them. Um, but yeah, so that's how you can transition the two words and all that stuff. And then as you go forward with the training of your dog, right, the teaching, the education, the parenting of your dog, you can start figuring out on your own conversational words to work with your dog. So you can have your own conversation, your own dialogue. But the the, the other thing of why I always use conversational words with my dog is because it, it creates respect, right? The, 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 the bond, the connection. Our dog cares, right? Like I said at the top of the, my vlog tonight. But it also means that other people may potentially be able to use that same type of language when that happens around their dogs. So we kind of take it off that way, right? People, you know, there's people who say, oh, you know, I'm always talking to my dog, right? Like I do myself, right? But there's also the part of having a, a regular conversation. I don't want to talk to my dogs just for the sake of talking to my dogs. That would just be like going out with somebody. Like if, if, I, was, if I had a girlfriend that just talked all the time about 
nothing in particular, I would be like, oh, okay. Um, right? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's too much talking with the, with our dogs means that they don't listen, right? The nagging, the cleaning up the bedroom, uh, their bedroom, right? That kind of nagging. They, they don't listen. It's extraneous. When I have regular conversations with them, I have regular conversations with them in the sense that it's not complex. It's basic. It is direct. It's connected. It's not using extraneous words because in my mind, if I'm using extraneous words, not only am I clouding up the, 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 the understanding that my dog is learning constantly from me and with me, I'm confusing my dog. Because he doesn't know what I'm talking about. Like I talk about making a dog come to you and how to do it on a leash and not being repetitive, right? That's an indifferent one. So that's that comes down on the part again of just using just the right amount of words. Petting and loving them is talking to them. Yes, Sammy. Petting and loving them is talking to them for sure. Um, but uh, I, I guess to to, you know... Uh, agree to disagree <laughs> is that I uh, I would just um, to deal with dog well I guess a form of dysfunctional focus right dysfunctional dogs that's that's so uh, because the dysfunctional dog is always going to be subjected to the more cuter tones of language because people go oh it's reactive or aggressive whatever all those terms are and the dog says. And then, I mean, sorry, we say to our to the dog, is like, that. oh, it's so sad. What a bad, oh, I'm going to take care of make you feel good. Mm, you know, I am. And then the dog's like, oh, okay, here it is again. I've heard that tone before in, in, with my previous family and blah, 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 blah. And shelter workers talk to me that way too. And they're just like, oh, okay, this means nothing. And what did I say? Uh, Mary says, I would say no, but they don't mind. I say to them, what did I say? And they mind. Right, but because you're you're adding on a, a secondary tier, you're adding on a, a, a more sterner tone of voice, Mary. Correct, but you're repeating the same command again. So what I mean then is adjust the way you're telling them the first time, and when you have to say it the second time, say it if you can the same way the second time. Like even with Lincoln, right? It's either stop barking, which I try not to say, but I it is stop yelling, stop yelling, and then if he doesn't listen, then you can hear how I escalate or elevated my my key, my voice key, and I was a, a lot more sterner, but I was still keeping to the minimal amount of words. I wasn't changing too much of it, and I was keeping to just the basics of the conversation. Uh, Sam said, don't get me wrong, I do talk to my dogs all the time. No, I, yeah, and, and uh, I know. I'm talking about dysfunctional dogs. I'm talking about uh, in the initial parts of getting, uh, for both you, uh, Sammy and Mary, uh, when you get a dysfunctional dog, not not just the not the regular, like, super happy dog you have nothing to worry about, but a dog that has dysfunction. When I get a dog like that, that is when I have to be cautious that is when I have to have a, a set conversation with them, an efficient conversation with them, because we're meeting for the first time. We have to have some basic understandings of how conversation goes. If I had, uh, uh, when Walter first uh, arrived, if I talked to Walter, Minky, seriously, Minky. If, if I have to talk to Minky, Minky, thank you, Minky. Yeah. Um, if I if I have to, uh, I can't I can't remember. Anyways, uh, um, yeah. In the beginning, when I when I'm dealing with a dysfunctional dog, I want to make sure that I have a, a consistency of conversation with them, so that they're always hearing the same thing. And if I end up talking too much to them in the beginning they're not going to understand what i'm talking to them and they're less likely to pay attention to me so it's like talking to somebody who talks really slow you want to listen to them 
you have to listen to them otherwise you're being rude right so we so i want to make sure that i'm always having a sincere conversation with them that it's relevant words that it's not extraneous so that the dog is listening for exactly what i'm asking them to do so there's no confusion on their end uh yeah so uh yeah okay so yeah um that's that yeah so that's the end of it i don't know how long i've gone i i i, I uh, wow it's it's almost like here it's uh almost 11 p.m which is way way too long and i apologize for just starting up late everybody uh, i want to thank everyone for um uh, tuning in if you enjoyed my little off the cuff somewhat improv spontaneous conversation that i had tonight uh please like and subscribe to my and um you know there if you can share my work that'd be great i'm at 497 subscribers which is phenomenal when i started doing this back in september um september 24th was my first vlog i think i had 230 240 followers uh, subscribers at the time and now i'm up to 497 and uh you know we're gonna hit that 500 that 500 uh subscriber milestone which is phenomenally uh amazing um you know it's just uh, really 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 lucky um and i appreciate everyone who's following me uh um yeah and brandy uh you know i saw that your post on facebook tonight about your uh your your dog your dane that passed away would have been i think uh, 11 years of age today so um, again, my condolences, my condolences to Sammy, uh, you as well as to Mary uh, for the passing of your mom. Um, you know, uh, Mary, uh, Mary, Mary Crawford is just going to cause a bunch of, bunch of poop with all the non-Dane owners today. She said, I think Danes are the closest to being human. <laughs> so, so <laughs> Mary, you're, you're causing trouble with all the other breeds. And then you're going to have a big fight <laughs> with, with all the other people. Like, they're like, no, you know what? But you, the, the, if, you, if you think about it, if you join different breed groups, German Shepherd, Pitbull, uh, Rottweiler, Chihuahua, uh, you know, uh, Corgis, if you join different dog groups, you will see people saying things such as the Velcro dog, right? The Velcro Dane. The dog that follows us everywhere, and I talk about how what to do when your dog follows you in the bathroom. It's in my my vlog list and all that stuff. <laughs> Sammy and Mary. So uh, I know Sammy, you're looking for a Great Dane somewhere in Hawaii, right? So maybe you should move from Hawaii to the mainland, huh? Ha <laughs> ha! Kidding. Um, but um, if you if you look at these different dog groups, you will see people saying similar things about their own breed favorites themselves too oh you know a german shepherd follows me my german shepherd follows me everywhere uh you know my um uh, my dash hound follows me everywhere and, and it, it's a personality trait it's a it's also reflective of a psychological uh, uh, um, uh um position that the dog has their status as well and their level of self-esteem and self-confidence and uh, not self-worth because it's a, that's a different part. That's a different uh, level of dysfunction that is exhibited. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, uh, Sammy, for sharing my work. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, you, Sammy and Mary, uh, you, you're finding finding kin kinmanship uh, with the Great Dane, so that's good. Um, yeah, see, Velcro Yorkies, right? So... Oh right, Yorkies. I'm sorry. I thought it was a. I uh, thought you had a Chihuahua. I'm sorry, um, Sammy. So so Velcro, right? So they follow us everywhere. And I talked about that in the vlog. Why dogs follow us into the bathroom and how to stop it. Uh, okay. So anyhow, I'm gonna let everyone go. Thank you so much. Uh, I am just uh, way over on time and all that stuff. For uh, tuning in on. Uh, uh, Monday, I'll have another vlog. I will probably do it from this cell phone uh, instead of uh, my horrible, horrible, horrible laptop, even though the sound's better, but we'll figure it out. But yeah, give me a couple of weeks. I'll figure out how to use the software. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have a lot of fun trying to figure out technology, and then uh, we'll see these things improve. And then eventually I'm going to be able to live vlog with a, with a higher definition camera as well once that happens. Yeah. Oh, you do have Chihuahuas and Yorkies. Wow, you have 
uh, but you don't have Danes. Ha uh, Not anymore, right? I remember that. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy yourselves. I will talk to you later. Have a great, absolutely amazing weekend. Please be kind. Please be patient with people. There's no rush. Be cool. If you see, if you're driving down the highway or a road and it's a two or three or four lane highway and you're in the far left lane and you're blocking traffic because you're just trying to get past somebody who's maybe doing the speed limit but you're trying to get past them or you're just blocking people behind you and you're in one of the faster lanes, do this. Turn on the right hand signal and go to the right and let the people pass you. Just be kind. You know, just, just be nice. Do something cool and nice. You'll feel better. Good night, everyone.